show starts in one minute. Good evening, folks, and a hearty welcome to our drive-in theater. We have a wonderful evening's entertainment lined up for you, one that will provide several hours of pleasurable relaxation and diversion for you and your family. Like nine out of ten film stars, Raquel Welsh uses Lux Beauty Soap. Well, no, I like... I like to be a woman and a man to be a man, you know. We hope you'll make this a weekly visit. You love the tasty array of snacks we have to offer. Bring your friends. There are always wonderful new pictures to see. We hope you have a wonderful time. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Long House, the weekly show for the sensible centrist. This week has been a real scorcher, a eh, lighting path. I know we don't live exactly the same place, but I bet that it's been quite warm for you as well. It has. It has. So, yeah, hello to everybody. And, um, to, yeah, to just to finish up the point, I, I don't think it's been raining here for three weeks now. It's just yeah, been... It's, it's, uh... Starting to become a bit you know, of a problem. Blazing sun every day for three weeks, which is great. But I get to. It's starting I get to, to tear break a up bit. my. Uh, yeah, I get to break out my khaki um, shorts and my flowery shirts and, and go full summer mode, and I get to use all my mint in in my backyard to to make mojitos and stuff like that. So it's it's great. Oh, um, yeah, it's. Uh, I'm not going to complain about good weather. <laughs> With us tonight, we have two new guests guests making their actually their first appearance. Um, and Kaos is the first one. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, it's been really humid here. <laughs> I'm sweltering right now, but, you know, what are you going to do? I've heard that the, the Brits have been complaining about the, the humidity. Yes, we we haven't had any of that, but it, it's just been hot. So I, I don't deal well with humidity, so I'm happy. Yeah, uh, I'm in New England right now, and it's it's very sticky. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Okay, Nord Huger as well. Uh, I doubt you're in New England. You're from, uh, is it Minnesota? Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah, Welcome. we've just finally been hit with some of this smoke from Canada this week. We were escaping it, but now it's caught up with us. But thank you for having me on. Uh, glad to be invited today. No problem. I mean, yeah, for, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Nord Huger runs his own YouTube channel in which he does uh, cultural analysis or history videos or streams with, with other people about, well, in general, you know, the, the Nordic identity, I suppose. Is that correct? Yeah, I think it's safe to say that. It, it's. I've been trying to broaden the scope of the channel to talk about quite a bit of historical subjects and elements with culture but yeah there is there's kind of that central revolving theme and cows you do you have any uh, socials you would like to plug before we get going uh yeah pretty much everything is just under at cow pill um i have a youtube channel with one video but i do have some more videos in the works and uh my twitter is under the same handle very good um, Luddy Path, anything you want to shill before we get going? Just the usual. Read Braxarchy.com and follow me on Twitter. Very good. And I'm going to have to do my due diligence here. And, of course. Uh, of course uh, yeah, we, I forgot. We're doing Let's Plays, right? Been doing some um, Let's Plays the That's last true. Saturdays, and um, we always forget to shill them. So it's, it's um, isn't it like we were streaming them publicly, but uh, we're putting them behind a paywall afterward? Um, the live stream is public. Um, but the the uh, recording is uh, locked behind the membership to the YouTube channel down below, or you can follow the link to the subscribe star. I'm working on a system where I can probably pretty much just port the videos over to subscribe star uh, once they go 
behind the paywall. So if you want to be a Subscribestar member um, instead of a YouTube member, you should be able to access the same content in that sense. Because, and I'm going to have to do this because this is now part of the scheme. Um, I'm going to put on the music. I'm going to get my plugin ready. Because every week we live stream the show for your listening and viewing pleasure. Of course, totally free of charge. But there are those few noble souls among us, men of exceptional character and heroic will that have decided to offer up the whole three dollars a month. And with this offering, they're granted exclusive member status and privileges. Privileges such as members-only videos, as we mentioned, community posts, emojis, or name badges. The Giga Chads gracing our channels as members are so far are the people uh, Black Socks Jack, Luddick Path, Nathan CJ Hood, Burr Carl, Nord Anon, Mr. Cheerful, Bulba Inquisition, Vingle, Tom R, Nord Huger, History, Philosophy, and Lore, Falling Outside the Normal Moral Constraint, Lantner, and Consumer. Thank you everyone for supporting the channel and supporting what we do. You're pretty much keeping the lights on when it comes to the software here and uh, on the stream yard. I was complaining before this video that uh, StreamYards is becoming a bit of a pain to deal with. All right, that's out of the way. Let's get into the actual show. People are posting <laughs> Ludic Paths in the channel. Very good. Um, I wanted to bring you on, Cows, and also Nord Huger, uh, mostly because of a couple of you know tweets and a video you made um, where you're lamenting the issues of trying to rediscover your heritage or identity in the cons in, in, in sort of the in the British Isles. Is that correct? Um sort of. So uh by blood I am Celtic. Uh I have great grandparents who were from Ireland and Scotland, uh, but many of them did uh reside in the UK before they eventually immigrated to the US so just kind of that whole area. Um, mm -hmm. And growing up, I always knew of my identity. Uh, my mother and grandmother were very close with uh, their relatives that they still had in Ireland, Scotland, the British Isles. Um, and of course, my great grandmother, who uh, was from there, my great grandfather. Um, and... The thing is, is that I never quite felt truly connected uh, as if I were a native, for example. I mean, who would? I'm on a different continent, never stepped foot where all these cultures, traditions, etc. were able, able to uh, develop. And I'm in a place now where I have the means to learn, to travel, to do my own research. And I've just sort of found that uh, being located where I am, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not in the greatest area. I'm in a very, quote, shall we say, multicultural area. Um, and I, I basically just, uh, like you said, I, I would like to reconnect with what make, you know, my people, my people. And um, I didn't mean to pigeonhole you, Nor Huger, but would you say that sort of the impetus for a lot of your work is some of the same things? Yeah, yeah, I would say there's definitely a lot of overlap there. I ran across Cow's tweet. I hadn't, I wasn't familiar with any of her stuff before, but I ran across her tweet, and I saw, aha, it's a, it's a fellow traveler. You know, it's not often that when I'm when I'm doing this sort of trying to trying to reawaken this sense of an older more more directly tied back connection to european roots it's not often that i find anyone under the age of 85 who's interested in that sort of thing so it's it's refreshing to see someone who had a similar similar outlook on it and a similar way of similar desire and passion to actually you know tap into this this sense of history and this sense of continuity that's a bit more primal than the modern American identity. 
and that's a lot of what it comes down to is is there's the modern American identity has really become so fragmented and so schizophrenic that there is this sense, especially as I got older, I came to this realization that, hey, if I'm, you know, when I have a family one day, when I'm going to pass down a culture and a set of values and a set of uh, a mythology to my kids, you know, what can I tap into? And the current trajectory of America doesn't doesn't leave much there to pass down. So I started looking back into what was more primal. Uh, and in my case, all of my family hails from either Norway or Sweden going back four or five generations. A uh, little bit, I hate to break it to you boys, but I'm, I'm slightly more Swedish than Norwegian. So, so Oof. Oh, yeah, I know, I know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's hard for you guys to handle that, but it's true. Well, and uh, you touched on some things there, Nord Huger, that I would like to get both of yours opinion on, uh, which is sort of the idea of what the American identity, broadly speaking, is. Because apparently there there seems to be, when you're talking about it, Nord Huger, there is something there that is, you know, the American identity is a thing, right? It is, it is a feeling, it is a place, it is a mode of being that you don't want to be a part of. Yet at the same time, usually if you try to discuss this with Americans online, or especially if you try to criticize America for uh, for embodying this identity, the, the usual response is, well, America has a lot of different identities because every state is different. What do you think about that? Cows, do you want to take this one? Uh, yeah, I mean, the whole uh, concept of there being, you know, using the different states as an excuse, obviously... America is the size of what basically is like essentially 50% of a continent, at, at least population wise. And to be honest, I think it's just a bit of a cope because it doesn't factor into the whole melting pot concept that I feel like a lot of people with identity issues in America sort of, you know, <laughs> their issues stem from. Um, I mean, over the course of. American history, uh, everything basically being done by immigrants all from all over the world with their own cultures, their own cuisines, their own traditions. Um, it, it seems like in order to sort of get a sense of semblance, none of that was able to be preserved. So it, instead of, you know, continuing to practice, even just like on your own, it seems like over the course of generations of Americans being here, first generation, second generation, et cetera, um, every sort of thing that made each culture unique here uh, that people sort of advertise the melting uh, pot concept on just sort of fizzled out. I mean, you can buy Chinese food from a Chinese person. You can buy Italian food from an Italian person, but other than that, there's no real, like, cultural centers. There's nothing really that stays true to what the culture originally was. Mm. You get this sort of warped concept of being blank American. You could be Irish American. You could be Italian American. But <laughs> if, yeah. if any of those people wanted to go back to Italy, they'd be screwed. <laughs> they don't know how to yeah, act. They, they don't, they, they don't, have no frame of reference. Yeah. There's the... Yeah, no, like, the there's the famous scene, like from The Sopranos, where when they're talking to like Italians, it's like, "What the hell?" <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so there is this overall sense that there's this monoculture that has sort of slowly been chipping away at whatever the original identity was, right? Yeah, which is and you, you could which also would say, "Oh, go ahead." Oh, sorry. Go. No, you can go ahead because I have another question, but I don't want to move on if you have something to say. Oh, just just gonna say that it would seem that there are people who are definitively a part of an American ethnos, and and another word that I think should get used a bit more often is the concept of ethnogenesis. You know, if if a group begins as one thing, it is possible for new ethnic groups to form. You see this throughout history. You know, Mexicans, for example, are an entirely new 
ethnic group derived of the fusion of multiple other ethnic groups into one. Same with, you know, what we'd say the English being this fusion of Germanic and Celtic in this really fascinating way. So it's not to say that, you know, if someone is one thing or a population is one thing, they're that forever. And there's no possibility that if, if one tribe marries into another tribe that you can't get a third new thing, because that, that happens pretty frequently throughout history. And I think it's safe to say that there is an American ethnic group And that's probably best described as those who have been in the country for a number of generations that are this sort of broadly, broadly Northwest European stock because they tend to have been here. Yeah, you would say like the Germans, the Brits, the the Norwegians, the Swedes, etc. The 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 original wave, right? I I wouldn't say all of them. I would say I would say certain subsets of them that have come together and have intermarried and have fused their culture around a set of particularly English traditions and English values, Mm. but also with this expansionist and free roaming quality that the space in the American continent gives. It's a bit wordy, but that's, that's my take. Well, I mean, it's difficult topic, so I don't expect you to have a one word answer. Um, Because one thing that is curious to me, you know, as someone in Europe, uh, and when you're describing the sense of loss, that to me is kind of hard to imagine because I'm sort of, you know, it's the waters I swim in, right? Um, It's not something that's easy to, you know, describe, but there is a feeling of what it means to be, you know, a Norwegian for me because I live it every day in a sense. Mm. And and you are experiencing a loss of that. Um, why would sort of seeking back to the European roots be the answer? Is this not some sort of? I hate to use the word cope, but but wouldn't this be solved by, as Nordiger said, just make your find your own community <laughs> in in the U.S. Um, I I mean. Uh... It's a bit difficult to explain to someone who's never experienced this. And this can be easily written off as, like you said, cope or placebo. Um, I don't mean mean for to, to call it that, but... Uh... No, 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 no. I understand. Uh, just over the years of, uh, like I was saying before, uh, researching Irish history, Scottish history, European history as a whole, um, I, I felt that there was... Uh, just something that seemed so foreign to me, but it was strange because it didn't feel like it was supposed to be foreign. It, it seemed familiar and foreign at the same time because I, I don't know if it's because I've stemmed from people who have lived in Europe, uh, you know, been around European architecture, European cuisine, that sort of thing. But, um, uh, moving on, uh, when I was able to go to the UK for the first time, my uh, flight went from my state and then kind of did a loop over, uh, like sort of more north than you'd expect, and then came down over Ireland and then landed in London. And it was january so and the flight was arriving in the early morning and it was very dark and i was looking at the flight map and when i saw that the plane was flying over ireland when i saw that it was like that scotland was not far away i had this sort of feeling of longing that i've never felt before that i was just miles over the soil of where my people spent thousands and thousands of years and I just I wanted to like reach out of the window and just like touch it I wanted to feel it and I haven't had the chance to visit those places individually but I I felt like my heart was like connected to the earth beneath me and when I did land in London I had a similar feeling 
Um, I had had family that had uh, spent a lot of time there in history. And I just, I felt something that I'd never felt in America before. I felt, I mean, in, in the middle of London, imagine feeling a sense of like safety, a sense of, you know, <laughs> connection. <laughs> and it was weird because obviously like going through like airport security, you're seeing people from like a million different nations, but it was just something about stepping foot in a place that you've always felt you're, you're sort of supposed to be was just really profound. And I will never, ever forget that feeling. Hmm. Kels brings up a great point, too, in terms of understanding of time. And this ties in a little bit to how my own philosophy and my own perspective, as I've looked more into history and a bit of, bit of genetics and looked further into, and looked further into ancestry as well. As I've spent so much time trying to immerse myself in this history, you see there's another vision of the world that emerges which was much, much more... It's pretty safe to say that most, most Europeans would have had this conception of themselves until very recently, which is that we're not simply individuals who exist and are born into a s tiny slice of time and then we die and then everything else is unrelated to us in many ways you know we're part we're a link on a great chain of being and we're yeah. we're merely one step in a very long process going back and going forward and that as well i think especially when i started looking more into ancestry looking into genetics i started noticing i'm like wow it, if you see here there are all these ways in which the, the traits that people have, the personality, the makeup uh, on very small levels and on very macro levels, you see this form of reincarnation happen. And I don't, I don't mean reincarnation in the sense that your, your soul reincarnates or, or your, your specific identity reincarnates as, a, as an individual, but rather that your, your body reincarnates, your your tendencies, your traits. I mean, you can see this in a very basic example. If you, if most people look at their own families and they say, Oh, you know, this person takes after their grandfather or their grandmother or their aunt or uncle, they, they take after them yeah. in this way. Oh, my child takes up, takes after me in this very strange specific way. I mean, parents point this stuff out all the time and there are ways in which we do have this reincarnate quality. And that's something that, gets forgotten about a lot and it is to say that you know let's say cows for example her her people lived a certain way a certain pattern of being in a certain geographic area living a certain way with the land for ten thousand years and to say that all of that suddenly goes away after a few generations of living in land that's you know relatively similar that that suddenly erases 10,000 years of of history and of generations i think that that on the surface surface of it seems fairly ridiculous to me yeah that's a good point that um you know europeans shouldn't necessarily laugh at americans for wanting to to try to rekindle that and it's not that it's impossible as well We've got 10 pounds from Nathan C.J. Hood, who says, I think Brits suffer from this too, to an extent, or at least certain classes in England. Even with the culture and history, we were detached from it. It is dominated today by USA. Quote, anyone can be a Brit. Well, that gets us maybe bungling a bit into the other thing, which is sort of, the European response, or, sorry, the American response very often to European criticisms here. Um, I think you wrote a note, Nord Huger, that says, um, how much of European hostility towards Americans who look to restore their connection to their heritage is justified and healthy, and how much of the hostility is because they're acceptable targets to criticize and by the regime, you says. Um, would you like to expand on that? or uh... You know, I think it's 
you see a lot there there are whether people like it or not there are natural tribal instincts that everyone has and today i think a, a way that our current ruling establishments like to take that tribal energy is by redirecting it against you know our own our own people is you know saying oh well if you're if you're a brit let's say then you're going to you're going to use this tribal energy and hostility instead of you know someone who's coming into your country and causing crime and causing destruction and harming people it's to instead take that energy and say oh you know someone who someone from america who's of irish descent but maybe is a little bit rough and doesn't quite understand they're a little bit rough with their history and maybe don't quite understand modern Irish culture. It's to say, ah, that's the person you can attack. That's the person you should go after. And, you know, I, I think the Irish are probably the worst example of this, where you get this <laughs> fervent sort of Irish nationalism, quote unquote, Saint Irish Patrick's nationalism. Day, uh, nationalism. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then, the, but they use that really as just a justification for progressivism and whatever the, whatever the spirit of the age is that they're, that their state and NGOs are trying to promote at that given time. And then that becomes Irish. That becomes the Irish spirit. And you've got to protect that from some, some American Irishman who is trying to reconnect with his in Ireland. Well, I mean, I don't want to evolve into just bashing, but the monoculture in America has a sense of, of making things extremely gay for lack of a better word. <laughs> Yeah. And, and Lodic Paths, you can you can attest to this with you're up to twelve episodes of uh, of Norse pagan cringe on your. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could have made fifty by the amount of content of. Uh, right, they, but, but that's essentially the same. wrong there. <laughs> it is it is essentially a lot of the same things. There are people there who are, you know, desperately desperately reaching out for an identity, um, but it's been twisted into this weird sort of product right you can buy thor's hammer and it says anti-racist <laughs> on it or something right um and it's it's very strange to look at from europe well that's very real uh and i don't want to discount because i think that is a healthy response from europeans to say all right no we don't want this unbelievably kitsch consumerist version spat back out at us this like crazy funhouse mirror version of of our history in our culture and have have a bunch of uh, fat American neck beards going about <laughs> because they saw something on a Marvel movie or they watched the Vikings TV show and now now they're gonna bring in all their their terrible lifestyle and their terrible ideas and behaviors into it. That's a very real phenomenon. So I think I'm there actually is kind that of, healthy side. I'm actually legitimately kind of mad at um I have never watched the Vikings show, but uh um they have like I'm not sure if they use it as the intro. They they made a song out of Erika's saga, I think, or is it Life's saga? Uh, Egil's uh, saga. Egil saga, sorry, uh, which I have recited. I think. Uh, Are you talking about the My Mother before. Told Me song? But yes, and they uh. translated the made into My Mother Told Me, <laughs> which I think is a very nice song. I think it's a very it's a very nice song, and and especially there are some artists. Uh, I think there are Norse who sing it, and like the old Norse, they use the old Norse verse, put it with the. The new song or the new music and i think it's quite nice and in isolation right it's nice but then you know there's this like weird larper in america who sort of constructs his identity around this and and then i no longer know what to feel about the song right <laughs> um it sort yeah, of it poisons it, it. it kind me. of poisons the well there yeah yeah um if i can touch on that a bit um i just going back to America, you can see so many examples of when American, quote, culture began to develop as early as in the original, like, 13 colonies. It, once we sort of, uh, like, became our own place, we were hyper fixated on the idea that we are not British, we are not European, we are our own thing. And... It just, it seems like that culture didn't develop in a natural spirit. Um, it, it wasn't, it wasn't naturally occurring. It was out of spite. And that is sort of, you know, manifested into the America that we see today. 
I mean, it's very easy that people will get bored. They will take some an interesting idea like St. Patrick's Day or even like in Mexico, like Cinco de Mayo, for example, and they will just Americanize it because we want to be our own thing. We don't want to be sort of blockaded by these horrible European traditions, you know. I, I mean, uh, it, 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 it's with media, it's with um, cultural practices, holidays. Um, if I can go on a tiny little tangent, I, I, I have an experience of this in my own life that uh, my great grandmother who came from Ireland had this, I, I don't know, it was like a recipe for like potatoes or something. Duh. <laughs> but uh, she developed it in Ireland. She was using Irish potatoes, Irish butter, seasonings, that sort of thing. Then she came to America and gave birth to my grandmother, passed the recipe along to her. But because it was in America, everything had to be American. You couldn't be seen using that Irish butter. You had to use the American butter. You had to use the American produce, the American herbs, that sort of thing. And down another generation, now my mother learns the recipe. And it's it's not quite, it's still not quite American. She wants to tweak it to suit the American palate and change this for that and exchange this and that, whatever. And now I'm here. I'm eating this cuisine that apparently has been passed down to me from generations in Ireland. And I know that what I'm tasting isn't what they tasted in Ireland. I, I'll i never know what the exact recipe was because it's just been altered and changed and just, you know, made into something that it wasn't originally. I, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of snickering behind the microphone here. I'm imagining either something with mac and cheese or something that's deep fried <laughs> when you're speaking it. Uh, um, there's good, there's good American cuisine. I, I'll defend my my. American there's there's a lot of good American cuisine. Yeah, it's not that uh, it's bad. It's just that it's not what it was. It's not traditional. Yeah, yeah. I suppose that's that's the problem right there. Is is the problem that it's not born out of a mode of being the cuisine? I mean, like it, it the cuisine of a of a people in that sense is a cuisine of a time and a place and a way of being, right? And mm. and the American cuisine has a tendency to sort of abstract itself from that. Well, I, I mean, again, that just goes into America needing to be ever evolving. You'll see a beautiful old building for example that's been preserved for as long as america's been here what maybe like 300 years and they'll tear it down and just build something new on top of it like like nothing because oh that's old it's falling apart whatever right, they just they want something, something new that's something i get from you know americans when i've talked to them and and, and when the criticism of you know the idea that well, I usually don't say it, but inevitably someone will say that, you know, Americans have no culture. And what usually comes back is that Americans, or sorry, they don't have an identity. What usually comes back is that the identity of America is an identity built on what you said, you know, the willingness to tear down everything in pursuit of sort of quote unquote progress. I'm not sure if progress is the right word to use, but uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a lack of identity is the identity. Do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I've I've butted heads with uh, several Americans and even several Europeans on this concept that um, it's it's strange to call something a culture that just hasn't been around. It doesn't have the history and what little history there was from the colonies up until what America is today has been so changed. So you know evolved or progressed like you said past a point that it wouldn't be even recognizable um and that goes for architecture food uh social behavior you know um yeah and and that's not to say that uh cultures like long-standing cultures don't ever evolve 
but it's just the rate at which America does it and sort of like infect areas around it, especially with media now and travel and transportation. Mm. Uh, it, it's just, it's so easy to be caught up in this needs to be new, this uh, out with the old and with the new. I, I feel like if America does have a culture, that's pretty much the basis of it. Well, I mean, I mean it's, it's can... a bit of a double-edged sword, isn't it? Sorry, go ahead. Mm. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, it's easy for people in our spheres to kind of like, make fun of that but the, i mean there's something to admire about people who are forward looking right that's that's not a bad thing in and of itself to, to think about the future and try to create new things uh, i've usually been very kind of impressed when i've been into the united states at like the rates that they're able to build buildings uh finish projects and so on it's, it's not it's not really bad but i think it's really the you know what's i think the reason that so many people are turning away from it now it would either be because of the fatigue or people just don't have that belief in the future anymore that they used to um i, I mean from my perspective i would say that uh I, i've met like-minded people who see america in a similar way and I, I feel like the fundamental thing that we are sort of lacking in america is a sense of permanence you'll uh see like you can you can go on like street view and like google maps or something and a street that existed in the 90s even like as recent as that or even the early 2000s looks completely different to how it looks now and i, I feel like in europe you have a better sense of like when you have children when you have grandchildren you have a decent idea of what they're going to be dealing with as a society, social culture, the uh, sort of look of the place that they're in. And in America, it is just, there's streets that I've been on like five years ago and I'll go on it and I won't even recognize that it's the same street because it looks so different. Right. Meanwhile. Good point. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to contrast that with, you know, meanwhile, I grew up in houses that, you know, date back to the 1700s, right? Mm. In one form, it's like Ship of Theseus, of course, but uh, uh, the original construction is that old, right? Go ahead, Norbert. Okay. And just sorry, I just add to that point. And, and usually, I think uh, in Scandinavia and other European countries, they will write it into law that certain buildings just have to be maintained, even though the materials are oh, yeah, the same. Yeah. They, they will have to be maintained in the form that they existed in, say, in the 1700s or something. There's a oh, lot. No, I remember uh, uh, growing up when you know my parents had to replace windows or stuff like that, or they had to re replace like the, the the siding on the house, right? Things like that. There were, you know government bodies involved in order to make sure that the overall expression of the house didn't change from the original. Uh, but back to you, Norti, you were about to say something. The way that a lot, the way that the majority of people from any group operates is they're, they're thinking most of the time just in their day-to-day -day or week-to-week, -week, maybe year-to-year, -year, but by and large, it's it's a lot more rare increasingly for people to think multi-generationally to project out into the future because historically that was not, you know, the, the majority, the mass of people are not influencing these pivotal changes where you're getting revolutions in technology and you're getting revolutions in demographics and you're getting revolutions in culture facilitated by technology it's we're we're in very unprecedented waters and a lot of people don't have the they don't have the the cultural technology they don't have the the mental tools passed down to them to think and project into the future beyond all right how can i just get through my day to day how can i you know a lot of people are more concerned with okay can i can I find a boyfriend? Can I find a girlfriend? Can I get yeah, a job? Yeah. Can I get my house and and just take care of the day to day necessities and the, uh, the things of life? That's sort that... of uh, that's sort of the basis for. I mean, as I conceptualize it, the basis for a tradition or the basis basis for a form of conservatism as built into a society. Because 
if you go to my Substack and read the fridge theory of politics, which is basically like a, a redux of a lot of elite theory, I mean, that's how the world works. I mean, nine, nine times out of 10, you're operating on heuristics and you're looking at what's in front of you. And uh, Robert Conquest said, everyone is uh, conservative about what they know best, right? Uh, but that also makes it important to construct systems either culturally or actually in law that preserve the things that people don't have the capacity to think about all the time, right? Especially yeah, it, these things yeah. where we have stations in society whose job it is to think about these things all the time, right? Well, and, and it comes to this point too. Reasons. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and it comes to this point too where when people are making decisions, and a lot of this comes down to family formation, people are, part of it's the paradigm of, sexual liberation, which is that, you know, the purpose of, of marriage and sex is about happiness and self-fulfillment. So people aren't thinking in terms of anything beyond that, any sense of duty or moral obligation. And beyond that too, it's, you know, people aren't thinking, well, what's the world that my grandchildren are going to grow up in? What am I, what proactive steps can I take now to actually build out a long-term vision for the future? I don't want to say nobody thinks this way, but it's increasingly it's increasingly rare. I mean, it's it's important to note as well, um, especially in America, but uh, sort of around the Western world, that these issues that are facing you right in front of you, like starting a family, buying a house, those things for hundreds of thousands of years have just been essentially like a guarantee. <laughs> in uh in societies and uh that's not to say that people didn't have to work hard for them but we're in an age now where uh you don't know if you're ever going to be able to afford property the younger and younger people get the more that that sort of concept is up in the air and uh that causes people to not think about the long-term effects of their decisions because their present state is just so, I mean, for lack of a better term, like kind of horrible and unlivable. Uh, that you, firstly, yeah. you don't feel a, a support of a culture or a society in these issues. Everyone is very in individualistic. That's another part of American culture that um, I don't really identify with. Um, but that it, it seems like now an aspect of uh, current American culture is just the fact that everyone is just struggling. <laughs> that's what people seem to identify with. That's, that's the common denominator, common element is that everyone's everyone's living under techno capital and suffering. We like the t same TV show. We use social yeah. media, and we're suffering. <laughs> that's that's where we're at right yeah. now. Well, I mean, I, I think that certainly goes hand in hand with uh, millennial humor as well, which is usually yeah. very self-deprecating. Uh, so that's a good point, that the monoculture now is just, you know, everything is shit. Am I right, guys? Mm -hmm. uh, this, me... this also kind of comes to a question, too, and I do want to address this point, which is a response I'll often hear from Americans when one is looking to connect back with their older culture, and this is easier for some people than others. I understand that uh, some people even maybe they're they don't even know where they're from, or they're you know they don't have contact with their grandparents or family members that can tell them about their history and the story of how how they came to America and and the part of the continuity that they're in. But I, I often hear from Americans, particularly you know conservative Americans, patriotic Americans. They, they'll often say, well, okay, well, why, why would you turn against America or why would you, why would you want to identify with something if you're, you're living in America or why would you want to connect with something else if you're already living in America? And this is, you know, you're broadly speaking an American. And if I had to be blunt about it, frankly, I'd just say the American, the American system just is not. It's just of inferior quality. It's of much lower quality toward, to the history and to the, to the 
embedded mythologies and embedded cultural wisdom that you find in older European nationalities, older European ethnoses. These contain a much stronger foundation from which build and live off of than what America has become. And there are parts of American American identity or American culture that are very strong, that have that do have very high quality elements of them, but it's the exception rather than the rule, especially today. And I don't and identity is probably the wrong word because Identity has this sense in which it's something that you choose and it's something which is something which is this thing you just feel and much like, you know, the conception is, oh, I can just change my identity to whatever I want. Perhaps a better word is being, you know, mm. this is, this is, I, my I like being. using existence, but yeah. Or existence. Yeah. Um, because what? it's, 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 uh, it's not just a time and a place, but it's also a uh, well, yeah, a mode of being, as you say. It's a it's a way of life. It is a, a philosophy and a spiritual existence as well. Yeah, and it's it's essentially like okay, why would I raise my children as to be Americans if I have this other heritage that stretches back much further? And that has proven that it can stand through the test of time and produce produce quality quality peoples, quality nations out of it. And it it has this much longer track record. And it is what I am in my in my essence. There's nothing I can do to there's nothing I can do to remove that from my being. Even if I act a certain way that is reflective of me as a Scandinavian. You know, if I if I go out and take some action, this is this is just as much a reflection of Scandinavian being as anything else because it's you know it's it's in me. It's not something I can abstract myself from. Your uh, your com your internal compass is always uh, driving you towards the nearest IKEA. Is that right? <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah. I you know I just find my car in the parking lot there, and I, I have no idea how I got there. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that uh, these sort of concerns that you hear from like very patriotic Americans can be boiled down to if things were comfortable, then we wouldn't be having this conversation right now because there would be nothing worth talking about. And when people started to immigrate to America, things were good things uh you know sort of had a natural order to them of sorts um obviously with a lot of progressive influence but uh when immigrants started coming here my uh relatives um or my ancestors came in the uh early uh or late 20s early 30s so like right through like ellis island they came to new york and then just kind of scattered throughout new england and um, there was sort of an essence of when in Rome, do as the Romans do, like once they got off the boat. But there really wasn't a clear cut idea of what like the Romans were doing, you feel me? But uh, they were starting, it, it, it began a cycle of becoming devoid of who you were when you got off that boat. And this is just, it, it sort of encaps encapsulates the melting pot idea that once they started you know losing what gave them a culture Id cultural identity had kids who are feeling the same way uh even subconsciously um it just well, there sort seems of... to be oh go on sorry I, I didn't mean to i just while i have the thought yeah um there seems to be a disconnect from the early <clears throat> the earlier generations to the more you know, modern generations, because uh, uh, some of the clips um, that we use in our intro, uh, the woman who talks about men and women and the old men playing uh, playing in a band at the end there are from uh, an old show uh, on the, the state channel here in Norway in which uh, uh, a local singer um, and host, he goes to America and hosts these uh, 
you know, sort of Norwegian American evenings where he invites a, a bunch of old people, basically, right, who are Norwegian Americans who either uh, at some point came over themselves or have family that came over and who have kept their uh, culture alive up until that point. It's, it's basically like a show and tell <laughs> show, pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have, you know, people who have kept newspapers written in Norwegian alive in certain towns, you know, since. Um, for, for, for over a hundred years because that's what their their father and their grandfather did right um but it seemed that it died with it died sometime in the early to mid 1900s that that was just like a sharp cutoff for a lot of that stuff what well, do you think about that when people started to immigrate they uh it was very common to have uh, little boroughs of like segregated areas like the Irish would live on one side of town, the Poles would live on a different side, the Celts would live on a separate side, you know, um, and you could still have the like textbook uh, or sort of like propagandized like melting pot experience of like, oh, we can go to the Italian part of town or we can go to Chinatown and get some good food and like see how they're doing but then we can always go back home and yeah i i feel like over the years that sort of segregation and even though it was naturally occurring has been discouraged and in doing that what made each uh group of people in like early uh the early 1900s and earlier uh unique was stripped from them and uh it, it, it's just i despite america in and of itself feeling like an unnatural kind of unnaturally occurring country it, it's natural that if you have a bunch of people from a million different places living in a contained area that there will be intermixing and through that, their individuality will be lost. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's very true. Yeah, quick, and, I'll... It, it, well, oh, go ahead. No, uh, I'm going to bring up some super chats so you can uh, you can finish first. Yeah, just going to say that. Yeah, you you can get this formation of new communities. You can get, you know, through through intermixing of groups, you can get something new. This new third thing, but it's. You know, you're gonna you're gonna gain some things in that process, and you're gonna have to sacrifice some things in that process. And it comes down to this decision of, okay, do you want to do you want to become part of this new third group, or do you want to retain? And that's that's a choice that people ultimately have to make. You do see that reflected a lot too in a lot of communities around the Midwest. You'll see, oh, there's a here's a town named Stockholm that was settled by Swedes and may, remained pretty much extremely Swedish up until the last few decades. And you can see that as well in like little Norwegian towns or things like that, where you do. I think there's literally this. a town called Norway somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think so. <laughs> in, in my state alone, there's a uh, Berlin, there's uh, Manchester. There's uh, obviously like New York, uh, there's New Hampshire, like every every place is like named after. Yeah. Like pretty much every place is named after a, a pre-existing place. We even have a Bethlehem. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, um, I'm gonna bring up a couple of uh, super chats here real quick, and and uh, then we'll move on to some other questions. Uh, first of all, Melon for two dollars says, "Sorry, Europe for my cringe countrymen." Well, it's not their fault. <laughs> uh, Americans have a great patriotism in them that I would argue has been misdirected, uh, and that comes to bear whenever a European like me try to criticize their culture. It usually goes, usually ends with threats of of invasion. I find <laughs> it's a it's a healthy instinct. I think. I mean, I grew up as a kid 
I remember in second grade, I was, I was on stage at my elementary school singing, oh, I'm proud to be an American and just like yeah. belting it out. And I was so, I was so patriotic, but also what I viewed as America and the values that we're in were part of being in a small, largely Norwegian town growing up. So it, you know, that sense of patriotism was, it was tied to something that was not America as we understand it today. Mm. It, was, it was an older. It was a more local. Indeed. Yeah. Local thing. Yeah. Now that song um, is banned from schools. Is it? I, yeah. I, yeah. I think oh. it is. Because uh, uh, Trump used it as his like walk in like intro song for his speeches. Wow, that's uh, that's a reason to to ban it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. AA's natural carving motion for five pounds says the current grand U.S. meta narrative is at the expense of heritage slash founding stock Americans rather than for them. I think we all sort of agree on that. Uh, what I find, to, to connect it to the, the previous topic here, what I find weird is that Americans will defend this idea by saying that America is still number one. Um, they'll agree up. to this point and then say, but we're still best, and if you try to criticize me, I'm going to bomb you. Um, it's, it's very strange. I, yeah, I always wonder. There is this idea, I think, especially among a lot of, a lot of the WASP class or a lot of a lot of the older stock americans a lot of a lot of the anglo and british descendants that they still have because of the american mythology they still have in their minds this idea that you know they're running the country for their own interests and they have they have power in modern america but when you look at the behavior of you know recent administrations and you look at the behavior of the the actual institutions that hold power in america it it really paints a very different picture and that's why i would i would maybe ask for some of these more anglo americans to to maybe reconsider how they how they view themselves as being connected to the regime the current establishment versus being their own nation within the boundaries of the the American economic zone, you could call it. Right. Um, Tamina here with a funny comment says the suburbs have fallen. Um, I think that's, that might be where the problems start. The, the bread and circus isn't doing it anymore. Yeah. Let's see here. <laughs> Nor Huger, you had a, a, another couple of uh, questions and stuff that, you brought to the table here and i want to make sure that we've hit everything um you had a question here saying with europeans becoming minorities in their own native lands due to mass immigration how does this change the situation i mean that's interesting um norway isn't quite there yet um but i think if you project the numbers ahead you know 100 years then uh, the situation has changed a lot and <laughs> as weird as it sounds what about a repatriation program for, <laughs> for diaspora Americans who want home <laughs> it's it's also hard to know it's hard to know how many diaspora Americans actually exist for any given any given nation in Europe a lot of a lot of people in America are kind of new ethnic groups that are derived from a fusion of various ethnic groups. So how many of them are, act, are, you know, any one group in particular, it's, it's really hard to say. There just isn't a lot of demographic information about that. Mm. So I, I think the issue that cows and I have, or some of the questions we're asking, we're still, it's still fairly niche. And I don't know if that's a result of just being early to asking these questions or if it's a result of, just being in a unique situation as people in America, as people of, you know, somewhat particular European heritages that are, are looking to reconnect that have a closer connection than other people might. What do you guys so, make of that? So, so yeah, no, I actually have a follow-up question. I mean, you mentioned it previously that you struggle in finding people under 85 to 
discuss this stuff with who had that interest and it's actually I have, I've had a similar experience when I was trying out these sort of uh, DNA softwares like my heritage 23andMe is not available in our zone of Scandinavia but I mean I came on to my heritage just to look at you know who are my relatives and it kept suggesting to me people who will have like similar DNA matches but everybody was like 80 and up but mm. do you see this changing do you see more young people coming into this have you noticed any difference or is it still just like you're the, the one guy who could be like the grand grand child of everybody else <laughs> it's i'd have to say unfortunately it's a bit more the latter i've i have quite a few friends and some of them are aware that you know they're also there's quite a few swede norwegians actually the swedes and the norwegians ended up intermarrying quite a bit because they you know they were close enough in language and culture and background that they they got along pretty well but a lot of a lot of my friends who are swede norwegians they just they haven't really looked into it much or they it's it's very hard to get in there are so many steps that you have to take in a mindset framing of values to even get to the place where you're you're putting you know your heritage as a primary value it's one thing sort of the american american sense of patriotism but it's a whole other thing to tie back here's the here's the steps of experience that it takes to go back to to go back to something that is more primal and ties into their heritage because it's it's quite removed from people's day-to-day -day experience. Mm. Or down on here asking the tough questions about if we repatriate Nord Huger, would we put him in Sweden or in Norway? Um, I think were we to do that, uh, I think the culture has to be seen as close enough to allow either. Right. Um, I mean, wh wherever he wants, uh, yeah. we'll take anyone. I really like the repatriation stuff. Actually, uh, that that should be like our um, our political project now. <laughs> now that I think about it, just like re <laughs> repatriating yes, for America to back, offset yeah, back, back into uh, to Europe to offset birth rates and uh, populations. Well, and, like and the other thing, yeah. I think it would be healthy to too to refund. Oh, sorry, Ludic. Yeah. No, just go on. I was just going to say that I think it would be healthy to reestablish some of these connections between, you know, whether it's the, the Irish and the Scottish and the English with cows or whether it's with, you know, the Scandinavians or the Italians or so forth to find some of these small towns that are still largely keeping some of these traditions alive and to try to revitalize them and to, to bring people in, in America, uh, you know, it's hard to say how much of a future there is long term for these towns in America, but it is a thought that perhaps there is a place to reconnect a bit more. An interesting thought. Um, not sure if you're going to find any Democratic Party that is willing to go <laughs> to go to bat that. for it. Um, it would require a change of structure, certainly. Um, I mean, uh before we move on, do you mind if I touch on the uh, no, no, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I think the reason I'm on this stream is because I was uh, looking into ancestral passports, and I I check every few months because things are ever changing, and um, I found out about ancestral passports uh, in my sort of Trump days of watching Fox News and. There was a there was an advertisement for <laughs> what other than birthright Israel, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah. So it's oh, I've like, gotten uh, those ads too. Yeah. Yeah, it was a uh, oh, if you're at least this, this, and this, you could qualify, or if you have a relative that lives there, you can qualify, and like all these different uh, like guidelines. And I looked into ancestral passports just out of like curiosity I, I wasn't looking to move anywhere at the time um and over the years i've found that um ireland believe it or not is uh one of the most like liberal with ancestral passports and uh in my research of just like re reconnecting with my heritage i began to see advertisements of oh uh Ireland offers uh, repatriation, ancestral passports, and um, 
they said, if you have a great grandparent that lived in Ireland, you may qualify. And I was like, yes. So I, I clicked on it. I was looking at like all the government websites and the guidelines. And one of the qualifications was that your parent had to claim ancestry before you were born. And because I was born and my parents did not claim that ancestry, I'm no longer eligible, even though it's the same lineage. It's, it's the same Ooh. distance between yeah. r- relatives. And just little like bureaucratic things like that just are so frustrating. And I've had I've had moments where I am checking to see if there's updates because sometimes things will change like every few years. And it it seems like they're not budging and it seems very similar for other European countries. And it's it's quite sort of emotional that uh, for me, at least, that a country would willingly bar someone who is of that soil, who is of that stock, you know, but they will be free to let in any sort of like rich Arab who pays for a passport or like random like foreign students who qualify for diversity scholarships it it just it seems it's a disgusting practice and um it's been extremely frustrating (laughs) doing this research it's a very blackpilling does it feel sort of like being turned away by by family or by extended family i i mean in in a sort yes because um I was talking earlier about that that feeling that I got like simply by flying over Ireland for the first time and um you know like in doing like my research of like Ireland just feeling so connected to that place and Scotland as well um and it, it's just it's very frustrating that this is an option that's available to some but not all and I understand that there's reasons for that and I understand uh there's definitely a reason that uh, birthright Israel is a thing and birthright Ireland isn't. Um, but it, it, it doesn't make the blow like any easier uh, that this is a place that um, just like not even a hundred years ago, I could have walked there. I could have lived there. I could have worked there. I could have had my life there. And now just due to, bureaucrats it's impossible <laughs> that's super chat i, I i've genuinely yes. been suggested that just just paint myself brown go in a little canoe you know oof well i mean uh there has to be some sort of like uh scholarship stuff as well um because i i know that they're taking in a lot of people to like write the code and work the work the call centers of like all the foreign companies that Ireland is uh, is hosting pretty much through their tax laws. Well, the thing is, is that while that is an option, um, and also like marriage visas, for example, like if I found someone in Ireland and married them, I could basically be let in. Uh, firstly, it's very expensive. And secondly, it, it kind of feels almost underhanded because... I would be treat- treated the exact same as someone who was like yeah. from Jamaica, for example. Like I'm treated yeah. as just total foreigner, no connection whatsoever. I can hold my my heritage results that literally says like 99.999%, you know, uh, Celtic up to them and they wouldn't bat an eye. It's just like, oh yeah, you have an Irish last name. You look very Celtic. But uh, you are, you know, in the same boat, uh, no pun intended, as like all the brown people trying to get in. Right. Um, Nord Anon has a question here or a comment here that that matched something you said, Nord Huger, because if we're talking about the possibility of doing, you know, American repatriation to Europe, he says, in the case of Norway, there are more Americans of Norwegian ancestry than there are Norwegians in Norway. So we could risk swamping ourselves with people who are spiritual foreigners. I think you called it Americanization um, and asking whether or not Americanization had already happened. Yeah, uh, that's that's an interesting point. It's I would say that's only partly true. 
there's there are more Americans or there are more people in America that have Norwegian ancestry, but that doesn't mean there are more Norwegians in America because that could also include yeah. people who are just a little bit Norwegian. They just have yeah. Yeah. like a, a grandfather or a great grandparent who's Norwegian. In terms of actual, like just full Norwegians in America, I think it's. I was I was doing a little bit of research before the show, and it's something like 0.4% of the American population is Norwegian, which would, I'd have to run the numbers, but it would, it would be still a sizable amount of people, but they're fairly scattered. And it's, it's not to that same level. And also the other thing to consider, the people who would actually have interest in uprooting their lives, not that people in America are always as rooted as people abroad, but you're only ever going to find a fraction of people who want to make that sort of move. And I'm not yeah. even yeah. necessarily saying that I would make that move. I, I do think there is a place for... Is that the quality of person that you would want to welcome, right? Right, yeah. yeah. Um, there is, funnily enough, I'll, I'll do a tangent here for a moment. There is a part of Norway, there are several parts of Norway, but there's a part of Norway not too far from where I live couple of hours drive uh, on the southeastern coast of, of Norway, which in the 50s and the 60s, uh, they all um, took the boats over to America to work and, and earn money. Um, and they stayed there in like New York, usually, uh, or in the, uh, the area for like anything between like one to 10 years, 15 years. And then they move back, taking the wealth with them and, and, and all the new fancy home appliances, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, they worked as, um, they called it floor leggers, um, which is uh, a bastardization of someone who, you know, a, a carpenter. Um, uh, and uh, they moved back and there's this whole area of Norway, this whole basically town, like uh, it's a bit larger than a town, where all the roads have like American names. Uh, the way they talk is like filled with a lot of English. <laughs> uh, and it's very surreal to visit um, because it's, it's Norwegians who have become thoroughly American and then moved back, taking the American culture with them and then constructing something new out of it. It's very weird. That's wild. Wow. Yeah, that's bizarre. So, so they'll, they'll, they'll literally use English words in their Norwegian because they have forgotten how and then that get that gets passed down, right? So you, they don't like kinda... that word. They don't have oh. a Norwegian word for driveway there. They just call it the driveway, right? In English. There's still some... <laughs> in the middle of a Norwegian sentence. <laughs> wow. I mean there's still some parts of like the like Washington State on the West Coast has one or two towns that are still dominantly Norwegian and it's a lot of more recent Norwegian immigrants that live in those towns. And so, I mean, if you go to one of those places, it, it's, you know, the people are uh, quite a few of them are going to be speaking Norwegian, uh, but it, but it does have that still strong Americanization element to it. I think that also yeah, kind of touches yeah. too to the, the idea of feeling, feeling at home in the land connecting to that, which is that, you know, if I go out to, the West coast near the mountains and by the sea, for instance, or if I, or like when I went to Alaska a while back, I had never felt, I'd never really felt so much like, Oh wow, this is, this feels right to me. This, this landscape, this, this part, this latitude of the world you know, where you get the pine trees and you get the mountains and you get the sea. And it just felt just felt, uh, you know, my spirit felt at home in yeah. that sort of environment. Mm -hmm. The Midwest is partly like this too, because parts of it are very similar to Sweden. But there are parts of the U.S. I, you do see, you do see groups from different nations cluster around areas where it is where it speaks to them. the The landscape and the climate mm -hmm. is in line with what they what they're adapted to over tens of thousands of years. I, mean, I, I find that actually very funny because um, the algorithm increasingly likes on YouTube to serve me up uh, 
Midwestern humor, like people who make sketch <laughs> comedy based on Midwestern culture. And I enjoy them because I can sort of relate to them on a level that I cannot relate to a lot of other American content, right? So uh, there is this sort of overarching Midwestern culture, it seems, that that binds a lot of these things and, and makes it somewhat workable. Oh, yeah, that's that's funny to hear because, yeah, there, there does seem to be some crossover with that that sense of humor that's still been passed on. Mm -hmm. Um, I think another thing, just sort of about the uh, landscape idea that you brought up, um, I've, ever since I uh, traveled to Europe and have came back here, I, I, I don't know if this is, like, cringe, but I, I can't help but look around now and just sort of... Uh, internalize that we've only like Europeans who live in America we've only been here for so long in that these landscapes that feel so at home to us were once inha inhabited by a people that just due to conquest are more or less completely exterminated and it it's strange to like look at a famous landscape um, especially like going more and more west, um, you just like you can see uh, like how like the Native Americans would have lived. And I'm not saying that like conquest is a bad thing or anything, but when uh, when when Britain, for example, had colonies, um, when they had British India, they still it was obviously technically owned by Britain but they recognized that as a foreign land it wasn't what britain's recognized as their sort of place for example um they could go there they could live there if they wanted to but it wasn't british in like it was never an history. idea that there it ever will would be british either yes right. um and america is the absolute opposite of that we we took a place we wiped it clean and we made it something that is now ours, but there's no real historical backing. There's no evolutionary backing to me being on this land. Yeah. It's a hard thing to, to conceptualize the idea because either you sort of feel it or you don't, uh, the idea that, you know, you belong somewhere. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, that's the, that's the issue here for a lot of people who are sort of longing for a heritage they never had, I guess, in America. Mm -hmm. Had a lot of these towns remained firmly, all right, we are, we're going to, you know, we're going to boldly be a Swedish town here on the Midwest. Had, had a lot of that remained the case and they'd kept the traditions and the way of life, this more older way of life alive, I don't think you'd get the same level of alienation that you're currently seeing. I mean, if if these towns had said, all right, you know, we're just going to have an Irish community and we're going to maintain Irish traditions and have a lot of Irish families and continue to live here. But American life, largely due to the shift away from agriculture and family farming that no longer became economically viable. So people had to, some of it was a choice, but some of it is that people had to move to the cities to find work. People had to uproot themselves just so they could, just so they could continue their lives at all and have any, any margin of, of success. And that that's a big part of why you do get this, this crumbling because when you had a lot of these settlers coming originally, as as Cal has talked about, as we mentioned earlier, yeah, you did have a lot of these towns that did manage to take so much of that life and spirit, that older spirit of of Europe where they came from, and to to bring it here. But for a lot of economic and techno capital reasons, that that wasn't able to last. Well, I mean, that's another reason why you see um, communities such as the uh, Pennsylvania Dutch, the Amish, the Mennonites, uh, so defensive of the land 
that they're on is because when they're segregated in their own little communities, when they're when they're speaking Pennsylvania Dutch to each other, um, practicing their uh, longstanding traditions, um, it, it it's it's sort of um, immune to like outsiders. Like obviously, you have like American tourists that go there, and you unfortunately see more and more people sort of breaking away and leaving those communities, but. As you said, it's not something that's impossible, but these communities have been around for so long that they do sort of get an assumed protection. Whereas now, if you wanted to start, oh, I'm going to start an Irish-only commune or a a Norwegian-only little town, it would be seen as, like, a dangerous concept. (laughs) Like, you see... uh, You see... Uh, groups of people that try to um, make like little communities they're called like cults and even if they are otherwise peaceful they are extremely discouraged from behaving in that way of being so um, wary to outsiders so I feel like that would be something that's uh, a bit difficult in our current state well that's that's a good point too and a lot of that's because there's been this very twisted pernicious lie that's been propagated by the media for a long time which is that if you love if you love your people that means you must hate everyone else yeah and it's it's this really it's lie that you see especially thrown about at you know people of european descent westerners and it's it's not true in the least and if anything let's say as an analogy if you if you love your family that doesn't mean you hate other families or you hate your neighbors or, you know, if you love um, your spouse, that doesn't mean you hate all, If like, if I love my wife, I don't hate all other women. You know, as an analogy. It's that old uh, Louis Thoreau clip when he's, uh, when he goes to S- South Africa to meet that the Boer guy and he asks him, like, you're a racist. And he's like, yeah, but, but you're going to hang out with this, um, this African man. Who's your, who you say is your friend? Yes. Why is that? Well, because he's racist too, <laughs> or something. He says, <laughs> <laughs> and, and Louis Thoreau is just baffled. Uh, it doesn't compute to him, right? Yeah, and, and I think the, the word, like the word racist, I think is is this kind of pretty disgusting word that gets thrown around when really people are just talking about. Well, you know, I love, I love, uh, you know, if someone's Irish and they say, oh, you know, I love the Irish and I want to live around some Irish or. And people that gets thrown, but really it's it's an expression of just, you know, extended family. Like if you love your extended family, do you hate other extended families? It's like, no. And and also if you don't love your family or your extended family, in fact, you're probably gonna have trouble loving anyone else or truly understanding what that what it is to to love other people. I mean, I, I think it's important to note as well that um this kind of brings up the issue of um the ruling class obviously recognizing that there is power in numbers and i feel like that might be a reason why um also that these communities are discouraged from forming that the uh american family is decreasing in size on average um it's just these little things over the course of american history have just slowly made people more isolated from one another, especially people that share a cultural um, heritage. Yeah, and it's, you know, you see the same effect too as a result of, of global capital and perhaps that, maybe that's a bit too Marxist of a phrase, but you do see as a result of this sort of globalized market and globalized movement of people that, you know, I see, I see people who come from all around the world to America because they're sold this Hollywood idea that you can live really easy in America and you can make money without having to work hard and do anything. And then I, I see a lot of these people who come into America and then they're they're living in a terrible part of town and they're working in a Walmart under harsh fluorescent lights all day, listening to horrendous music on the radio all day. And they look like they're just in hell. And I, I feel terrible because it's it's something that's hurting everyone because no one has a sense of home. And mm-hmm. it's something yeah, that and, goes and every, even having direction. you know done my stint in retail as most people do growing up. I mean, it's nothing like 
the images you get from America. <laughs> and, and then to drag that out to, you know, this is going to be, you know, your $12, $12 an hour for the rest of your life. And then if you're lucky, they're going to wipe, wipe any debt <laughs> off when you die. Otherwise, it's just going to go to your kids, I guess. It's very depressing. Yeah, no, I, I, I would even uh, call it predatory. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, what? Just adding to the idea of the uh, the barriers to starting these communes and like these more uh, exclusive ethnic communities. There's of course the the whole stack of new laws that have been put in since like the 60s uh, through both civil rights legislation outlawing of restrictive covenants and a lot of these things that used to exist in the United States that you could do to to help foster these communities that are now it's either illegal or it's legally discouraged to do. So there's just so many hassles that you have to do, They're not just culturally, as we've been talking about, but also legally and financially to that are just stopping you and keeping you in this sort of uh, very atomized space. Yeah. Well, that's certainly a depressing note to, <laughs> to end on. I don't know if there's anything more we want to talk about. Uh, we're coming up on one, one and a half hours, and that's usually when we, we end these discussions. Nope. Uh, let's see. I, the one other point that I think would be nice to touch on at the end is there's this question of, well, you know, if you're, if you're in America, you could continue to assimilate into um, the sense of what it is to be an American, whatever that, whatever that means today. But that is, uh, and I don't mean this in a negative sense, but that's that's a slightly more feminine approach. It's this, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to you know, if, if you look at Nietzsche's philosophy, he describes feminine and masculine nations. And he describes the French, for instance, are a feminine nation. They take in elements of different European cultures from other nations, and they they grow and foster that in a way that creates something something new. Whereas he would contrast that with a masculine nation. He would say, uh, I'm trying to remember which nations he outlines as masculine. I think the Poles, the Germans, uh, the English would be masculine nations. And where they, they are asserting and they're laying out this other form of this other form of culture that they're putting out. And had there been this alternate history where Let's say my my great great grandparents coming over, if they'd all decide, all right, you know, we're gonna have our own. We're not gonna be Americans. We're not gonna assimilate. We're gonna have our own, our own turf, and we're gonna have our little little Norway, our little Sweden here in America. That's that's a very different mindset, and I think that's in some ways a healthier mindset to have. Well, I mean, I don't want to walk head first into something that I have no knowledge of, but isn't this sort of what Canada is? Uh, you know, that's, it's an interesting question. I, I'm probably not the best person to comment on that. You'd have to get, have to get a Canadian on here for that. Yeah. I'm going to have to talk to a Canadian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, un unfortunately, uh, possibly just due to its proximity to America, it seemed to have, you know, have the same fate. They still have a uh, Quebec and they still speak French there, but other yeah, than that's that, what I mean. Other other than that, uh, Canada. If you if you walk down a random street in Canada, you might as well be in Kansas. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, and and just that there there is this people people in their souls. It's impossible to erase the human need or the human desire to be a part of a people, to be a part of a nation. And this is something that, you know, if you're a Christian, you can look at something like Acts chapter 17, where Paul outlines how God has, God has set aside the dwelling places and boundaries of the nations. And that this is, this is something that ordained because it is this primal to, to what it is to be human. And that is the natural healthy state. And without it, what we get now is, you know, it's the love of money 
corrupting these higher values or values which should be higher and sublimating all these ideas of having having home or having a people into just being just being tools or slaves to capital yeah maybe i shouldn't use the word capital again that sounds a little it sounds a little too marxist i'm not marxist but it is it is this sort of love of money over love of other things that yeah. should be yeah. placed higher in the hierarchy mm -hmm. i mean that's the foundation of the american dream it's uh you know work hard buy ving have kids they do the same thing i did not mean to rhyme but anyway <laughs> <laughs> well but it's born out of the same sort of this kernel of of this uh you know eternal drive that a lot of the americans seem to have that maybe they left left uh europe for almost yeah a, a lot of the reason too that many people left the Scandinavians, uh, many of the Germans moved to America to begin with was less out of this. Some of it was out of this spirit of art. We're going to go out. It's this Faustian spirit. We're going to go out and we're going to settle new lands. So I would say that's half of it. And then the other half is the Industrial Revolution creating overpopulation in these countries. And you simply couldn't sustain mm. birth rates. You know, the, the infant mortality kept dropping. So in my family... If you go back to Sweden, especially, there was only so much land to divide the inheritance between sons. So you could only you could only pass down your farm and divide it so many times before you don't have anything of value. So people said, all right, yeah. you know, we we've got this other place we can move to. Again, we're going to rally some of us together and try to meet back up in the Midwest or some some people went to the East Coast. Some people went to the West Coast. And they said, "All right, we're going to try to forge forge a new path here because you know there are just too many there's just too many people here and not enough land." I mean, yeah, there certainly is a practicality to it as well. I when when I think about this, I try to uh, put myself in the shoes of what may have been offered to these people that did end up immigrating, and um, I I used to have like this like deeply seated like. I don't want to call it like rage or anger, but I, I just like, I'd want to like shake my great grandmother and be like, why the hell would you move here? But <laughs> it's, if putting, putting yourself in their shoes, you see like this cool, newly built shiny boat pull up to your little farm town where your life is, you know, not really adventurous or interesting it's like, hey, come here to the land of opportunity. Here's all the places that you see in like Hollywood films. And it's going to be so cool. And you get to make so much money. And look at all the houses are bigger. The streets are bigger. The cities are bigger. I mean, like, like you were saying before, that the sort of Faustian nature of that, it, it does seem very appealing. Um, but it's just the unfortunate like course of time and history, uh, what it turned into, just... Uh, <laughs> really really did not turn into a good thing yeah well i mean what you end up getting then is essentially a nation of people who can only identify themselves in opposition to the place they arrived from right mm -hmm. which then sort of turns into the idea that for modern americans you know the identity is to not have an have an identity <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and but a lot of that wasn't organic too. I think we need to keep in mind with yeah, at the, some point it got got subverted. Yeah. Obviously, well, with, yeah. with the first and second world war, there became this real need to have a cohesive American, uh, a very very cohesive American identity or sense of sense of us as contrasted with the Europeans across the sea, because you know we were at war with certain parts of Europe and. If you have Americans, you know, you had a lot of Germans, let's say, in America, and the Scandinavians are, you know, we look similar enough to them that it's like, all right, well, we're going to have to stamp out, we're going to have to stamp out these residual, these residual ties that, yeah. that the Japanese in the Second came World over. War, right? Yeah, exactly. Same, same scenario with the Japanese, uh, because, you know, if people have these ties, then, well, on a, on a geopolitical level, that's going to pose problems. You know, it's harder to motivate people 
unless they're part of this new group as opposed to groups across the seas. Yeah. Hmm. Well, <laughs> I'm not sure if I have more or less questions than when I started. Um, yeah, I mean, if I could just leave off on a note, I would say <laughs> at, the, at the end of the day, I mean, what what we're hoping to do is to to reconnect. I mean, it's sort of like reconnecting with extended family across the pond. And it's just trying to rebuild these these familial connections that we have um, because, you know, the world's a chaotic place. Culture changes rapidly from generation to generation. And we want to make sure that, you know, we can preserve, we can preserve the heritage and we can preserve the, the culture and traditions and the history that we have together. So it's, I think the best way to come at it is just with the spirit of, you know, all right, we're, we're all, we're all sort of distant family here. And it's, it's for the best of all of us. If we, if we reconnect with, that which goes back further in time and, and binds us together. Absolutely. Uh, one other thing that I uh, sort of think about regarding this topic um, and sort of a, a an ending note for myself is that I, I, I hear a lot of uh, commentary from Europeans and um, it's just like some, peop some people even that I uh, spent time with in uh, the UK and it, I, I was in a place that um, would have been quite familiar to my ancestors. And just like, I was looking around at everything like a little kid. I like, just like the shapes of like the farmland, the, the high streets of like each town, for example. It was just so fascinating to me. And um, it's... It's something that I've heard like Europeans be like, yeah, that like shows that you're American because like we don't bat an eye at that kind of stuff. But I, I feel like there's something um, to sort of end a bit positively here that is almost like a childlike innocence of reconnecting with something that is in a sense yours, but still so new to you. So if I ever did get the chance to, you know, reside in uh, the country of like, my ancestors, what I'd like to call my homeland. I, I feel like as someone who is, who has been deprived of that may appreciate it a bit more than someone who just kind of takes everything for granted there. Um, and obviously there's benefits and drawbacks to that, but I, I enjoy feeling at home in those places. All right, very good. I think on that note, we're going to end the stream for this evening. And I'm going to humor Leo Borealis in the chat for a moment here because he's, he asked me if I ever <laughs> worked <laughs> retail. Yes, I did. I worked in kitchens. I worked retail. I worked uh, for the longest time. I worked uh, at a computer shop, actually, so where I did retail and or some tinkering. So I have had... A few odd jobs throughout the years, but not not as many as as a lot of other people. And you got to earn the money somewhere. All right. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you, Cows and Nordhuter, for coming on. Thank you, Ludic Path, as always, for being here and for helping with the channel. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Do we have a plan this Saturday, Ludic? I'm not sure if I can make. The gaming stream yeah i don't know i i have some games queued up if people want to watch uh there's going to be just something. go down the list the list of the uh, the poll you know i think i'm going to run noita this saturday yeah uh people saying I, I i've actually okay i say i've worked retail but i haven't worked in supermarkets i'll say that right i worked i worked in other retail. stuff other types of uh, types of retail that's some lore for you. And on that note, thank you all for watching and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.